Hi, today I'm going to talk about the time temperature superposition, TTS. I'm going to explain what it is and how you can use it in your material model selection and calibration. So let's start by thinking about the material that you're testing. You do a tension test on the material. Uh, you, you measure the stress relaxation response specifically. You may get the curve that's shown here. So the stress relaxes over time in some way. Um, so that's all good. But what if you do this test again at a different temperature? Um, for example, a higher temperature or a lower temperature, as you can see here. And in some cases, when you do these additional experiments at different temperatures, you get the same exact curve, except that it's shifted left and right. And uh, if that's the case, that's really good, of course, because if you can measure the curve once and then figure out how much the curves shift, you can then predict the response, the relaxation response at any temperature in that range. And this is the whole idea of time temperature superposition. It's based on the idea that the curves shift in this way at different temperatures. And the, the, the mathematical equation for this is basically to say that it's a horizontal shift when time is on the logarithmic scale as shown here. And uh, here is the, the scale factor A of t is, is how much it's, uh, the curve should be shifted. And uh, this is equivalent to say that the time itself scales with temperature. So at the high temperature, time will go faster. At the low temperature, time will go slower. And this is directly from this experimental observation, if it applies, of time temperature superposition. Um, remember the TTS can be applied to any material model. So if this is indeed happening in an experiment, you can apply this concept of changing time scale to any material model. It doesn't, of course, really make a difference or it doesn't make sense to apply it to an elastic or a material model that doesn't depend on temperature itself or time, um, but you could. Um, it's typically uh, used for linear viscoelasticity and it's rigorous for linear viscoelasticity. What I mean by that is that Linear viscoelasticity is a material model that really all the relaxation response um, and the viscous response can be captured by this PRONI series, which is a way to describe the amount of relaxation that occurs. And if you shift the relaxation curve, you will shift the PRONI series in this simultaneously and directly. So this is a rigorously uh, true for linear viscoelasticity if the material uh, satisfies this shift factor that you can experimentally examine. Um, but remember, if you use this in a finite element simulation, you still have to also scale the elastic or hyperelastic uh, response um, because linear viscoelasticity is not just a prony series. You also need an elastic or hyperelastic component with it. Um, and those materials that obey this kind of behavior, they're called rheologically simple. And, and of course, not all materials are this. Uh, way. Uh, so this is not always true, but if it is true, it can certainly be uh, useful. So again, it's easy to test to see if this applies, and I certainly recommend that you do that if you are attempting to apply this TTS to your material modeling uh, yourself. Um, one common way this is done in a finite element program is what's called the williams landau ferry WLF equation, which is written here. This is just the equation that tells you how much uh, the time should scale with the temperature, the three parameters, C1, C2, and T0. And so this is one, one option. This, there are other ones that are available in finite element programs, but this one is relatively common and is used frequently. What I will do now is to show you how you can uh, examine this and use this in M calibration. So here's an empty window M calibration. I'm going to start by defining a material model that has this time temperature superposition activated. So I'm going to select an abacus hyperelastic viscoelastic material model. For simplicity, I'm going to pick some very simple hyperelastic model, perhaps the Neohokian one. Um, just picking one prony series terms is sufficient for our demonstration here. But I'm going to activate WLF time uh, temperature superposition in this uh, list here. So I select that one and I get a warning saying, well, uh, you should specify your experimental data first. Well, we don't need to do that in our example. And here it is. So here is the, the, the hyperelastic component. Then we have the PRONI series. And the last three parameters here are the uh, WLF equations, T0, C1, and C2. 
So we want to examine this. One way to do it is they're going to define um, uniaxial tension, six different strain rates. So these are virtual tests. So look, what happens if we use this material in, in uniaxial tension at three different strain rates? If you have real data, of course, you can uh, insert that here. So if I run this once, you will see we, we did a test here. We examined the response of this material model at six different strain rates, from very high to very slow. But they all came out to be the same. And that's kind of interesting. Right? This is, again, how this time temperature superposition behaves. It all depends on how you select your prone, the, the time temperature parameters here, particularly um, T0, which is the reference temperature, was set to 100, 350 here. And all of these test cases that are examining have a temperature that is 293 Kelvin. So we're way above it, and that's why um, they all ended up being the same. If I change this T0 value in my WLF equation to 290, perhaps, and I run it again, we'll see that now we're starting to see strain rate dependence as one would expect. So if you have data at different strain rates and also at different temperatures, you can find both the PRONI series and the WLF equations at once using this approach by searching for these parameters, for example, in, in this way. Um, in M calibration, there's another feature that can be useful in a case like this. It's, this is the, this one here. I'm going to look at how the, the modulus, uh, the predicted modulus depend on temperature. So I'm going to make this here from the lowest temperature, 260 up to 310, perhaps. Uh, and then I'm going to evaluate this. And this shows with these particular parameters here, we get the secant modulus that, that is almost constant until we reach a certain temperature at which it drops a lot. And drops, the amount it drops will, of course, depend on the parameters we have, and particularly the, the amount of a prony series G parameter, some G. So it drops close to 90% of, of its uh, shear modulus in the case that I'm examining here. So, so that's really how this works. You can insert your own experimental data. If you have DMA data at different temperatures, great. If you have stress strain data, that's also OK. Um, the predictions is, are going to be uh, taken into account the temperature that was used for each of these conditions. So if you're not familiar with the WLF equation and this type of TTS superposition, uh, I, I suggest you explore it. Using M calibration has a lot of cool features. You can kind of learn how this goes. It's a little bit surprising how strong the temperature dependence can be for these materials. Uh, and that can be very useful to know. And also, you can incorporate that in your finite element simulations to get really accurate predictions of whatever you're interested in. If you have any questions, you can ask them below.